up, everybody? Welcome into another Talk To Me Tuesday night. We're hanging out with To Me with Talk To Me Podcast. This is David from Dead. And it is Tuesday night, and we've got two great guests tonight. We've got David and Rich, both from Breaking In a Sequence. How are you guys doing tonight? Very good. Thanks for having us on. Good. Thanks for having us. Look AKA at the bias. <laughs> yeah yeah we'll get into that man but uh first off we got to talk about david's uh fantastic american flag background you were talking uh before we started recording where that came from man give us a little backstory on that yeah it came from a, uh i had a friend who's uh I, I, like 10 years ago i not, haven't talked to him for a long time and he was he was an assistant to congressman john campbell and he gave, gave me this flag because the congressman had it flown over the capitol for a couple of days so i guess they take turns of the members of Congress flying flags and they give them out as kind of uh, presents. So I thought it was, since it was flown over the Capitol, it was kind of special. So I framed it and put it on my wall in my house here. Yeah, that's pretty awesome, man. What do you got? You got anything yeah. cool like that, Rich? <laughs> nope. I'm in, I'm in a blank office. I like to keep everything nice and white so it drives me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, the last time I spoke to you guys, you guys were biased and now we're breaking in a sequence. So uh, what's the, what's with the name? change you want me to tackle it david sure so i mean last time it was bias um and you know we rode with bias for for a long time but a lot of people and a lot of fans kept coming to us saying hey we can't find you guys on like yeah, that's a very hard name on uh you know like the digital platforms and everything and we slowly started to realize that people couldn't find the inner punk on their uh on their keyboards, you know, it's like a, you have to go into the alt <laughs> keyboard to get to that dot. Right. And it, it really like screwed things up for us. So we sat down and thought about it long and hard. And, and during this whole rebrand of everyone rebranding, we're like, you know what, let's just pull the trigger. Let's, let's go something a little bit more, you know, specific and original, you know? So we basically decided to, um, you know, extend out the bias and, and use it as an abbreviation. You know, so we'll, we're officially breaking in a sequence, a.k.a. bias. You can call us bias, you know, so you don't have the same, so, so many syllables, if you will. Yeah. yeah. And then the new song, Delusional, out now. Uh, you can get it on all the, all the platforms and everything else. Tell me a little bit about Delusional, David. Um, one of my favorite songs we've ever written, I can tell you that. <laughs> um, it's, it's a good, heavy groove song. Um, it's, I, I, it's, it's a great song. I don't even really know how to describe it. It's a, it's a really good song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, so one thing too, it's like, you're, you're one of the few drummers and I, I don't even know if I said this last time I talked to you, but you're one of the few drummers that when you hear you play, you know, it's you. And so it, it's definitely coming through on the breaking, uh, in a sequence stuff. So it's, it's awesome to hear you playing. And when I go down the, you know, the YouTube rabbit hole of, you guys is uh you know videos and songs and live shows everyone is just like thank god david is back playing drums you know fortunately that's really cool thing for you to say i appreciate it I, i've actually heard that quite a few times over the years and i just i think it's a huge compliment and i just you know i i really to me it just feels like i'm playing drums you know when i play i don't think I, oh i'm playing something of my own style to me it's just playing but when everyone so <laughs> says that to me it's just a really big compliment i appreciate it a lot yeah, you yeah. know what started all all of this, especially delusional. When we when we first started playing, we were trying to you know like just be a rock band. You know, we wanted to have like lots of melody, you know, lots of melodic parts. And then we wrote pity, and after we wrote pity, like something changed, something clicked. It was like a little bit heavier than what we were doing at the time. And literally one day at practice, I look over at David, and he is playing with his entire body again. I'm like, whoa. I think we're onto something and we, we realized, Hey, you know, we need to go a little bit heavier. And then, um, when we, when I walked into the studio and they had just the, the music, the instrumental for delusional, I was like, Oh my God, this is crazy. Like, this is yeah. David, this is David playing for real. This, this isn't, yeah. you know, all the other crap that we heard. before. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny listening to this stuff and obviously reading the comments. I mean, you guys, have a feel of a certain band that David was once a part of, but it's, it's one of those things is like, is it, 
because of what you guys sound like or is it David? And I think a lot of it kind of just, it's just, that's the way David plays. That's how he's going to play when you hear him, you know, on a song, it's going to kind of remind you of corn because it's David and that's David's sound. Absolutely. You know, we'll bring in, we'll demo songs, you know, just with like program drums, bring it in and then David will start playing over it. And it's a completely different song. Yeah. Just because how, <laughs> just because he has a different ebb and flow, you know, to his playing. Yeah. And if you guys are watching on YouTube, watching on Facebook, make sure and comment. We can pop those up. Uh, we've got a couple of comments. We've got uh, Brandy Nelson saying hello to everybody. And uh, Christopher Salvador saying hello to David. It's kind of cool Hi, to Chris. pop those up. People watching Hi, live. But uh, yeah, man, it's just like, it, it's, it's one of those things, David, you know, kind of going back just throughout your career, you know, kind of getting the, I was actually watching some old LAPD stuff that's on YouTube. That's a a lot of fun to watch you guys, you know, super babies back then. Yeah. But, uh, you know, getting the band together back then, was it kind of a thing where you guys knew you were doing something different or were you just playing what you felt? Uh, you're talking about LAPD? LAPD yeah. into corn, you know, like this, that whole era back then. Yeah. Yeah. When, um, when we made LAPD, I think we were listening to a lot of um, Faith No More, Introduce Yourself, and uh, early Red oh, yeah. Hot Chili Peppers. And I think those two bands had a big influence on us. But then um, LAPD, we put out a record. We got signed to Triple X Records, but they, they didn't even want to put us on tour or nothing. So that, that, that was a, for real, probably a waste of time. But it did lead us to the conclusion <laughs> that we needed to get another singer and keep going. So after LAPD... We departed from the singer of that band and um, we all moved down to Huntington Beach from Burbank. And then we started looking for a singer. And then that's when we found John playing at a bar in Bakersfield. And at that time, a little bit after that is when we, uh, when Head joined the band, when he heard us with, with John singing, he thought, you know, this, these guys are really doing something different. But for some reason, between LAPD time and when we formed Corn, it's, it seems like, uh, especially for, for Reggie and, and James, it seems like, like a, a, a switch flicked in their head and they all of a sudden became twice as good of writers and they matured in their instruments. Like <laughs> over the course of like a normal 10 year period, people would mature. I mean, if you've heard yeah. the LEP stuff to the corn stuff, it's like night and day of, of the, of the musicianship, you know, and the riffs. So yeah. I, it, I'm not, I'm really sure how that happened, but it was like a matter of a year from LAPD or maybe maybe two years from LAPD to Corn, and it's just like something switched and they just started writing all these great riffs and um, you know it, it pretty quick we knew we were saw on something kind of special and um, it eventually led us to a record deal and then you know the rest is history. You know, kind of getting into to bringing this up to breaking in a sequence, David. For you, how does it feel? at this point in life, you know, starting a band, you know, I know you, I know you guys have been together for a couple of years now, but actually getting out there and getting a band back together, because I mean, I'm, I'm in my early forties and thinking about starting a band right now, I almost makes me want to like puke in my mouth. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, aside from this COVID thing, which makes playing any live shows totally impossible. Um, but I mean, even before yeah. that, it's a completely different game these days. You know, when we first started with, uh, with corn, it was all about playing live shows. So we were playing clubs from San Diego to the Valley. Um, almost like tw twice a month, we probably play a show. And then all of a sudden the uh, internet took over and it seemed like shows weren't so important anymore. It was all about social media, um, w which is kind of disheartening, but I mean, I guess, you know, times change with the, with the, you know, with the, everything going on with tech and all that. So I guess we just have to adjust to it, but um, it, I guess, yeah, it changed from live shows to tech and social media. And that's really the biggest kind of challenge is trying to try to adapt to it and change. What about you, Rich? What are you, you know, how are you thinking about the band and, uh, you know, getting to play with David and, you know, just the great songs you guys have been putting out? Well, I mean, you're a musician, right? So, I think that true musicians, once once a musician, always a musician, right? I, I'm sure you get right. that itch. And and if you're a true musician, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, that itch to play, yeah. right? So 
I was having that itch to play even before I joined this band and I was just, you know, <laughs> singing over Craigslist bands or whatever. But <laughs> I get to do what 99 point, I don't know, 8% of the population doesn't get to do. I get to play with one of my heroes of yesteryear. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. So I'm definitely going to do that. And, you know, if we have like a great connection in the band and, and great friendship and everything. So I think it's awesome. Absolutely. You got a fan question here from uh, Christopher Salvador. What was your favorite experience playing in corn? Pretty, pretty blanket statement there, but. Um, oh, okay. Blank. Okay. Blanket answer that my favorite experience was the live shows, the tours. <laughs> Yeah. All the tours were great. It was amazing. I, I got to live my childhood yeah. dream for real. I mean, and that's only because of the support of corn fans that we got it out of my garage and got onto the big stages and played arenas and stuff all over the entire world. So, you know, it's, if it weren't for the fans, I would have just been a garage band for, you know, for a bunch of kids playing music. But the fans caught on. They liked it. They put us on the big stage. And basically, my childhood dream came a reality. And I, I'm forever thankful for that. Yeah. Um, as Richard knows, we just bought a house and we're packing. And so I was packing some stuff the other day and I came across, um, I came across my Aussie corn life of agony flyer from the first time I saw you guys. And, uh, you know, what do you, what are your memories of that tour? Because that was, uh, that had to have been, uh, I mean, I went for you guys, but I know everyone else was there for Aussie. So I'm sure seeing corn the first time in from an Aussie crowd was, was pretty rough. You know what? Surprisingly, that's what we thought too. Um, well, let me back up here. The reason we got the Aussie tour was because Korn's record deal was through a subsidiary of uh, Epic Records called Immortal, and Aussie was signed to Epic Records. So, the first time we got on the Aussie tour, it was a connection within Epic Records to put us on it. And the first tour, um, I mean, th that was our first arena tour ever. So we we had to just been playing clubs, big clubs, with three eleven before that. And then we went right to arenas with Ozzy. Um, I don't ever remember anybody booing, honestly. But I mean, <laughs> since, since then, I think we've done four national tours with Ozzy. I mean, we toured with Ozzy more than anybody. No, maybe Metallica as much. Probably about the same as Metallica. But I know we did like four national tours with Ozzy. And every tour, I remember the. I was surprised because the 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 demographic and the and the crowd you know obviously i kind of thought i don't know how they're going to feel about us but surprisingly they liked us every time much better than i expected uh rich got a question for you uh, from john Beatty, the host of the brutally speaking podcast it says what is uh what has david taught you and the rest of the band as far as navigating the music industry that's been a surprise for you man i don't know Rich knows it all. I didn't teach him anything. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know nothing. Smartest guys I know. <laughs> Thanks, dude. Uh, I, you know, I don't. I don't really know. I, I just know that uh, I hate the music industry, like the business part of it itself. I hate it <laughs> with a passion. All I right. want to do yeah. is play music and write cool tunes. Like the business side can can just fuck off for a while. I don't know. <laughs> I, yes, it's, it does suck these days. Yes. And then there's kind of a follow-up flip side of that. You know, how is it being a mentor to these guys? David, you know, what's it like kind of being around a group of hungry dudes that want to do it, you know? Um, I don't feel like a mentor at all because everyone knows their craft. I just feel like yeah. it's friends getting together and jamming and playing. So I, cool. I, just, I just, I mean, to me, we're all on a level playing field. I don't think I'm above anybody from my past career. I respect everyone equally, and I think it's just, uh, I feel like just friends getting together and making music. It's great. Absolutely. I mean, that's, I think that's how we all feel, too. It's just a whole bunch of good friends getting together. And I, I think that comes out in the music, you know, like we had to build that that bond and that connection in order to grow as a band. And, you know, Josh, you know, just being in multiple bands, you mm -hmm. have to form that connection and it takes some time to form that connection. Yeah, that's probably the hardest part, you know, because you get four or five dudes in a room and four dudes on the same page. And then you got one rhythm guitar player that's, you know, having issues at home or something. And you're just it's a, it's a pain that, you know, pain trying to get everybody together, trying to get five people going in the same direction for anything has got to be is, is rough. Yeah, it can be. But we've been pretty lucky so far. Yeah. And as, as I said, everything, everything that comes out is better than the thing before. So that's that's definitely a, a positive direction, uh, kind of in the band. And we have seven more songs tracked, recorded, and mixed, ready to go. 
Yep. Besides delusional, seven more. What's the uh, so? What's the plan with that? Are you going to do an album? Or are you going to kind of stagger them out, like do singles one at a time? Stagger out singles one at a time. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, you feel that's a new way of doing it? Every twenty-four hours. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> Um, Sean A. Mayer calling you the god of skins, David. God of skins. Thanks, Sean. I appreciate it. I think the single approach is, is the way to go in this industry. Yeah. You know, because the attention span out there is is very limited compared to what it used to be. Like yeah. if you if you find an old school guy like us, we all want to hear albums, right? But you know, right. all the new listeners are are so used to just skipping around genres, ships, uh, skipping around artists and stuff like that. I don't think that if we released an album, it would get the the listening uh, or the attention that it would uh, get if we released them individually. Yeah, we're lucky if we get four minutes of their attention. It was like, I got to check my Instagram. I got to check my Facebook. I got to, you know, they're all yeah. flying all the place online and shit. So if we get their attention for four minutes, we're good. Yeah. <laughs> Scott, uh, friend of the show, Scott Stein says, I took freaking a leash back to the record store on release day because I thought I bought a blank CD, not knowing track one was really track 13. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> follow the leader, uh, right? Isn't that follow the leader? Not yeah. The yes. Leader? It, it, I, I yeah. Did, I, that actually wasn't me. I didn't have anything to do with that. <laughs> but wasn't there a sticker on, on the CD? I yes. thought there was a sticker on the CD that says starts on track 13. We initially did our first press of CDs and <laughs> albums to put out, and then we we had so many people, so many people complaining back to the record stores that we did put a sticker on the second release. Oh, okay. Yeah, we had to do that. That's too funny. Man. People thought they're buying defective <laughs> shit. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny, just like going back and and you know getting ready for this. Obviously, I kind of went down the rabbit hole. I mean, you know, corn uh, uh, came out you know, and my, I was 15 and corn was my band. Like that was end all be all band at the time. I mean, it was, and I've, I've, I've had head on the show before and I kind of told him the same thing of, it was a culmination of everything that I was listening to at the time, you know, biohazard helmet, faith, no more judgment night soundtrack. Like it just kind of all yeah. came, came together in one band. And, um, you know, I was thinking with this band, you know, David, you need to call some favors in because there are tons of bands that are still out there right now that owe you owe you a career. <laughs> I don't think about it like that. They don't owe me anything. <laughs> I'm just saying, you you guys you guys changed the game for a lot of people. I mean, I honestly I can't tell you how many how many people have told me that uh, we've created this new genre of metal, new rock. Um, yeah, new metal. New metal. I mean, sorry, new metal. Uh, and I just. I don't really know how to take it. I, I, I do agree that we changed the music scene and put the course of, of, of heavy music on a different route. Uh, but I mean, I, I just feel like me, I don't feel like, Oh, I did something. I changed the whole entire scene or it, it's not a feeling that I have. It's just, I guess, uh, I've heard it so many times. It just, I, I don't really understand it, but uh, I mean, I guess we did for, for all you know, intensive purposes, I guess we did kind of change the scene and created this new genre called new metal. Yeah, I can tell you that you you converted me from a Pantera, Metallica, Slayer guy into a Corn guy when I was 15, 16. Yeah, hey, I'm right there yeah. with you. We got a we got a hello from Brazil from Andre. Good day, Richard. Good day, David from Andrew. I'm assuming maybe in Australia. That seems Australia. <laughs> Hi, Andrew. Hello, everybody. And then. Uh, Got Dave Wathen here. He says, uh, seen David with corn at the brewery here in Louisville back in 97. Helmet and Limp Biscuit, great show. I believe I was at that show too. That was pre Limp Biscuit Day, I think, even having a record out. Yeah, you know, we uh, we found them in Jacksonville, basically discovered them in Jacksonville because we were doing a show there and a local promoter got them to open for uh, for us. We, we hadn't even heard of them before. We just said, okay. And uh, we saw them play once, and we were like, you guys are really great. We took them on tour with us almost immediately. And I think it was during our first tour that uh, they got their record deal. I think. Yeah. I'm not sure. But I'm, if my memory serves me right. Yes. Yeah, that was a great that was a great tour just because, you know, Corn Helmet and Limp Biscuit, you know, because at the time, you know, I think Helmet 
Actually, I think I was at the show in Louisville and the Louisville show, and I think the aftertaste by Helmet came out the next day. So they did a uh, record record signing that night. I still after love the Helmet. Show. Oh, dude, what a great band! I love Helmet. Yeah, same. Yeah, yeah. John yeah. Steiner, one of the, one of, an amazing drummer that doesn't get enough credit. Yeah, he's good. He's got some great chops for sure. Yeah, and then the um. You know, you've got some stuff out. It looks like you guys did a show in March at the Whiskey that the, you know, obviously came across really great too. Um, what are the, you know, are you guys able to? I know the Whiskey. I think it's the Whiskey that's doing some some live shows, no crowd, just kind of doing some fundraiser type stuff. You know, are you guys looking at doing any kind of live stream shows or anything like that? Uh, we have someone looking into the show at the Ventura Movie Theater. I don't even know what it's called. But other than that, we haven't really explored the possibilities of playing at the whiskey or anywhere else. I mean, maybe we should. Yeah, maybe we should. You know, you know that show at the whiskey was the last show at the whiskey. Period. Oh wow! Like two days later, everybody had COVID. Everybody. <laughs> Everyone. <laughs> yep. <laughs> the world ended. We're in purgatory right now. Yeah. Everybody got sick the next morning. Uh, no, yeah. The next day they shut down everything for COVID, so we were the last show there, and that yeah. was. That was supposed to be a, a showcase for us. So, uh, Luis here, big fan of the show. I will never forget watching David warm up on the drums in the Who Then Now VHS at the Indigo Ranch. Love his drumming. Tell us a little bit about the Indigo Ranch, man. That's a uh, you know a place of epic proportions there. Yeah, Indigo Ranch is where we recorded our first two records. It was owned by a guy named Richard Kaplan, and. Um, to get there, it was way up in the hills in Malibu. I mean, it even went to the roads weren't even paved. At some point, you have to get off the paved road, and you're driving on this <laughs> one-way dirt driveway or dirt road up the hill, and there's those little carve-outs. So if a car is coming the opposite direction, one of you has to pull out and let the other, or their car come through. And this is like a steep mountain, I mean, going up. So it's kind of scary driving. And you see another car, and you're like, oh, my God, we got to find a pullout just to let a car through. So we get up there, and then he has like this full bunkhouse and um, this amazing recording studio, you know, two inch reels. Um, so we basically stayed there for like six weeks. And I think we would go down the hill and uh, go to like a, I think they had like a Whole Foods or some kind of market down there in Malibu. We'd go down the hills like once a week and buy a ton of groceries and a shitload of alcohol <laughs> and take it up to the, to the, uh, to the ranch, they called it. Um, and as far as I know, I think Richard, he, he literally fought off two different wildfires in the hills in Malibu where the studio was, where at one point he was on the roof of the studio with the hose. And, yeah. his, and, I, and I think one of his workers was on the bunkhouse roof with another hose. And they were able to fight off two fires throughout the years, at least two fires, maybe more, but two that I know of. Um, and then eventually, this has been four or five, maybe more years ago, he closed it down. I don't really know exactly why other than everybody's recording on a computer these days in their freaking bedroom but hey david i heard it burned down yeah, i was gonna say i oh, think it, it actually burned down. burned down yeah yeah. Oh. yeah i think he lost it all um uh, he, he defended that place quite a few times i know that i mean <laughs> it was definitely in a burn zone you know i was telling you about the dirt road to get to it it was all dry brush around it completely dry dang that's a mess so rich kind of being around david i don't know if you're like me i did an album with uh fred Corey from cinderella years ago and when we were in the studio, like in between takes, I'm just like, Fred, tell me about David Lee Roth and Fred, tell me about Bon Jovi. You know, do you get like that with David or are you kind of like just leave David alone when it comes to that stuff? I just leave him alone. I don't do that shit, do I? No, he does. nobody does. <laughs> but let me tell you something. When I auditioned for these guys, let me tell you what they did. They put my mic stand right in front of David's drums. Nice. So I when I was singing for the first time in a room with these guys, I had to sing in front of David. Yeah. And that was kind of like, Whoa, what the, <laughs> you know, that was really <laughs> jarring for me. But uh, after I got to know him, you know, it, it was cool. After that. <laughs> we were putting you in singer position. Yeah. Yeah. Singer position. Yeah. Like facing you. <laughs> 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 Lewis said, I made it my goal to drink Coors Light because of the corn and the Who Then Now VHS. Yeah, they definitely should have given you guys some sort of sponsorship back then if they didn't. Hey, check this out. When we recorded Fall of the Leader, um, yeah. we, uh, we we rented this house up in um, – no, I'm, I'm, my, my bad, I'm sorry. When we recorded uh, Untouchables, we rented this house up in the Hollywood Hills, and uh, it was on a, a like a steep kind of hill. So Dude, when you, fall it, the leader, when you, David, was that fall leader? 
Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I mean, so many records, you know. So anyways, so the house is up on this hill. So you walk in and it's right into the living room kitchen and you walk out and there's a, there's a uh, patio overlooking a backyard that's fenced in. And um, throughout the entire recording of the record, everyone took their beer cans and threw them or bottles, whatever they're drinking, and threw them over the balcony into the backyard that was fenced in. And by the time we were done recording, we were ready to move out of the house. There was like a foot and a half deep of the entire backyard filled with bottles and cans. <laughs> it was pretty. I think we. I think the budget on that. I think we spent thirty grand on booze just during the recording of that record. It was ridiculous. You know, it's funny as I, I spent some time, obviously being a kid, fifteen. Um, a friend of mine, we, we would go see corn. I saw corn. I saw you guys on the first album probably four or five times in the Midwest. And uh, we drove to Knoxville the night after the Ozzy show. And it was like you guys and GZR and Life of Agony may have played that show. But it snowed really, really bad. And like Head and Monkey were all outside just like playing in the snow like like they'd never seen it before. It was it was pretty insane, man. Seeing kind of just seeing the expressions on everyone's face, kind of just being in, you know, six feet of snow. Yeah, you know what? I've got like eight coats in my closet that since I've stayed home here in California, I've never worn <laughs> since I've been on tour. It's literally it takes up like four feet of one of my closets, all these big ass jackets that I specifically bought. The only place I could ever wear them was like the Midwest and the East Coast for uh, during the winter. Yeah, it's probably the first time that those guys have ever seen really thick snow. I think that's what they were saying that night. Yeah, so it was, it was yeah. pretty nuts, man, kind of seeing everybody experience snow for the first time. Uh, Dave Wathen says, Indigo Ranch had a raw signature drum sound, in my opinion. Took the first two corn records, first Slipknot record, uh, raw, unpolished sound to me. When you were recording with um, with Ross Robinson, did he ever throw a flower pot at you or anything? <laughs> No, he never threw anything at me. Um, I mean, he would come in the studio where I was tracking drums, and you could hear him on some of the songs. You could hear him yelling because uh, he's, like, yelling, giving me cues and, and just, like, you know, reminding me to do stuff coming up. But you can hear him yelling on some of their songs. Ross was amazing. <laughs> Ross yeah, was yeah. Great. yeah. He's an amazing producer, great, really good friend, an amazing guy. One of my favorite uh, lines ever said on the show was I asked Max Cavalera that. And he said, yeah, but he, we were the first band to throw the flower pot back. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Ross ever threw anything at us. Well, he definitely got some emotions out of you guys. I'll tell you that much. Yeah, he did. Absolutely. Uh, oh, the uh, this is uh, um, Peter from uh, Metal Sucks podcast. He said he got to be in the corn cage during Family Values and all I did was watch David killed it from above. Great memory. Yeah, the corn cage was amazing. It was so fucking cool. And one thing I really liked about it, it was it was it's my idea to do it, but um, we took speakers, yeah, like big like PA speakers, and we we've, we've put like four speakers because you know it's two levels. So we put like four speakers at yeah. each level, and we cranked that the mix that was out in the house because when we first designed the cage, the first thing I thought was was. Uh, if the people are in the cage, they're only going to hear what they hear from the stage. It's not going to sound good. So I had our, our sound guy put four four uh, speakers in each level of it and crank the house sound back to them. Just because I didn't want them to hear what the stage sound. You know what I mean? I wanted them to hear everything. Just from a pure kind of fan question, I guess. I mean, what is it like as you know someone being so young at the time? becoming corn you know trl and everything else that kind of came with it man was it just a, a whirlwind it was a childhood dream come true literally since i was 10 years old i played drums and all i wanted to do was be a drummer um so when we got signed and we got tour support you know proper tour support and it got on real tours and had people working with us and setting up my drums and i didn't have to mess with all this stuff it was literally my childhood dream coming to true and i mean i've been fortunate enough you know as richard said 99 point whatever People in the world don't ever get to do it, but <laughs> I got to do it. It became my reality. I will forever be grateful to all the fans who made it possible forever. It was amazing. Yeah. I mean, just the fact that earlier, you're like, I don't know if we toured more with Ozzy or Metallica. You're like, <laughs> that's a pretty bad, you know, pretty, pretty rough thing to have. First world problems right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Rob, Rusha, uh, Rob Rusha from, uh, from zero. If you remember that band, uh, wow. That's, it's crazy. The front of house engineer must have really been good to be able to pipe the house sound behind the band. 
it was just another feed from the house system. It wasn't a big deal. He just he just put four more or four speakers for eight, eight feeds from the house. It, it's no big deal. Yeah. It doesn't require any extra mixing. <laughs> I just I wanted to hear what about the house. <laughs> yeah, great band. Um can we can we show off the records, David? Uh, you want to see the records? All right, uh, I'll take you guys change over there. The yeah, change. Right. Let's All go right. over to the records. Hold on here. Oh, let me get a little drink of water. As you walk in, uh, Cal Hines asking you who were David's musical slash drum influences slash idols. Uh, easily, uh, Mike Warren, Faith No More, Kim Alexander, Primus. Nice. So obviously, uh, Mike Borden filling in for you while you were sitting there next to him had been amazing. Him watching him play your songs, you know. I, I mean, it, it was amazing, but at the same time, I was sad because I knew I had uh, a medical issue I had to go take care of, so he had to fill in with me. So it was kind of nice. sweet but sour. Nice. So you want to so, see this record here? Yeah, this is pretty intense, guys. If you're watching, uh, watching on the video here. Can you see All that chord right there? Yep. Tell me when the record ends. <laughs> <laughs> See the whole thing? Yeah, there we go. That's it. Well, even the Family Value Store like soundtrack went platinum. Absolutely. Jesus. There we Damn. go. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you had that up when I was over at your house last. No, you know what? This thing has literally been in a box for 10 years. That's what I'm saying. It says uh, 32 million and now it's 50 million. This thing is this thing was made like 12 years ago. Yeah. Wow. Do you have uh, individual ones too, or you just had the one made? Uh, I think I have individual ones. Yeah. Uh, you got a couple more rolling in here. JR Official says, David, you probably hear this a lot. That you are my inspiration to become a drummer. Your grooves are always unique and innovative. I appreciate that. That's kind of what we're talking about. The David sound that I just think is just, just how I play. I don't really think about it in terms of, of, of a certain sound. It's just what comes natural. Probably because, as I was saying, my influences were Mike Borden and Tim Alexander. Mike Borden for more of the Tom Beats and Tim Alexander for the groups. Well, Rich, man, I don't want to leave you at this one. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, it was great. Like, even when Mike Borden was playing for Ozzy there for a little bit, I mean, it just made that much heavier, you know, seeing him play those grooves too. Yeah. Yeah. We, one of our, uh, I think our first or second, our second tour with Ozzy, Mike was playing drums. Our second, maybe third. Oh, nice. Yeah. That's where we met Mike. Yeah. 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 He had a monster band at that point. I think, was that Rob Trujillo and Zach Wild too? <laughs> uh, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I think the first time you toured with him would have been like, I think Geezer was playing bass for him. Uh, I think so. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Rich, uh, what you know? What vocal inspiration for you, Rich? I'll leave you out. <laughs> vocal inspiration. You know, I have so many, but uh, Scott Weiland is is up there in my top. Lane Stanley. Um, man, I could even I could say Phil and Sama, like. Oh, yeah. He's like one of my favorite singers. He's got the best voice ever. Like if I could scream <laughs> like him, I'd be happy. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I think everybody'd be happy with that. David, yeah. were you a Vinnie Paul guy? What's that? What were you a Vinnie Paul guy? Um, I, I like his playing. Yeah, absolutely. I, I just um, um, I, he, he we're totally different styles, but he he was great. Absolutely, he was really good. No. Any, uh, any any stories of uh, you know those guys showing up at shows? Any dime bag stories? Um, was it Vinny or Dime or both of them owned the strip club in Texas? Just Vinny. Well, we've been to their sh we've been to the strip club with all of them, and we ended up back at one of their houses after a show. Uh, nice. I probably shouldn't go into any details, but yeah, we were <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nice. we had a great time. They're really nice. They were really nice guys to us. They're super cool. <laughs> it, yeah, it was, it's for some reason whenever Vinny walked up to somebody it's like he threw his arm around somebody and it's like it's like he leaned his entire weight on you so you're like oh it's a guy get off of me <laughs> big sweaty guy yeah yeah of of the 90s man it was my my bands were were pantera and corn definitely um i think rich can agree with that yeah the uh you know 
breaking in a uh, breaking in a sequence. I don't know. I keep wanting to call it breaking in a silence, but breaking in a sequence. Um, you know, what are the the kind of obviously you have the singles kind of rolling out. We're talking about some live shows. Are you, are you looking at twenty twenty one before you can really get rolling, or what are we looking at? I mean, I think we're just looking at whenever this COVID thing they, they come up with a vaccine or you know or a cure, or whatever, whatever, whenever, whenever the economy opens up. I mean, I think we're pretty much stuck until then. I mean, unless we do like those drive-in shows I was talking about in um, in what, Oxnard, Ventura, Oxnard, Ventura, yeah. Like yeah, yeah. I mean, I think right now uh, we have a pretty good plan. We have an actual roadmap of what we're going to release and when, you know, while everything is just kind of shut down and in limbo. So we'll continue on that path, you know, with just releasing stuff. And, and we're trying to get together as much as possible to, to write new material, you know. So let's say right when things open, let's say mid-2021, we can hit the, the ground running. You know, we could hit the studio yeah. again and track a yeah. new record and release it or EP or whatever, you know. We will be Is ready. Is it something you guys want to? Is this something you guys want to start touring, like extensive touring, or where are we at with that? Um, I, I mean, it it all depends. I mean, first of all, we have to secure a, a record label with a, I mean, secure record deal with a label, and management and all that stuff. Um, and then hopefully, what they can offer us is, um, you know, an, an opening slot on the bigger tour. Right, you know, go right to uh, either theaters or I mean, it would be great if we could get on an arena tour, but I mean, the theaters would be great with me. Right, that's what I'm saying, man. You got to open up that phone and call some. Hey, you remember that? Remember when you copied all my drum <laughs> now, you, now you owe me. <laughs> Can you make the calls for him? No. Hey, I might, I, give, give me your Rolodex, David. I'll make the phone calls. Uh, another. I, I, uh, go ahead. I, I, I've never even thought about doing that, but it sounds good. Well, I'll, I'll nudge you to do it. Um, AH over here on YouTube says, David, if you could relive your top three shows throughout your career, what would they be? Uh, top three shows? Um, yeah. Let's see. Probably Woodstock 99, uh, Rock and Ring Germany, and uh, I, I don't remember a specific show, but I mean, we, we toured with Metallica when they're playing in the round. Yeah, that was pretty amazing. Oh yeah, that was cool. How did you like playing in the round? I loved it. I, I thought it was absolutely great. Were you on any kind of rotating kit, or did you just have to play with your back to people? Have, you know, for most of the show, just played with my back to the to the back of the audience. We didn't have a rotating budget back then. <laughs> Come on, man! <laughs> you should have just played uh, Lars's kit. Or Hetfield's yeah. kit that he uses to drum battle Lars. There you I go. doubt they would have allowed me to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. You got a, another hi for David. Got a hope to see you guys in 2021. We hope to be there too. Another, another yeah. hello to David. People loving the David. Hello. And then, um, you know, as. Are, are you guys going to continue to do more videos? I saw you did a video with Matt Zane, who is a who is a guy that I've actually toured with in the past. So, uh, you know, how was working with Matt Zane? Dude, Matt's awesome. Yeah, Matt he's is great. like as professional as they come. Like he was on set just yelling orders at us and and just getting it done, man. And I was super super impressed with with how his work ethic was on set and afterwards. He had us, I think, a rough edit in like some crazy amount of time i want to say like a day or two and he did it he yeah. did it with probably half or, or half or less than half of the crew you shoot a normal video with he was amazing i mean we're yeah, definitely he, going to go back with matt saying we do a video yeah he was like a one-man crew he, it's, he's awesome dude and i don't know yeah. if you've been following his other band his band's uh society one but dude he just puts content out no. after content after content he's got new songs coming out all the time yeah, they're on it for sure. Yeah, Matt, uh, Society One opened for us back in like 2002 on a tour. So. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, let's see here. All right, nerd drum question for David. How did David end up with the Pearl Decade drum kit versus a higher end kit and then the switch to the 2002 Pisces versus the signatures and Rudes in the past? So that's super deep nerd stuff. Okay, the, the drums... Um, I was playing, 
Star Classics from Tama, which is, they're all maple shells. So I, I just really wanted to try a pearl kit. So I got the, uh, the Decade Maple, which is kind of comparable to the, to the Tama Star Classic. So that, that's the reason I got that. Um, it was mainly because I wanted to switch to hardware. I wanted to use the Pearl rack, but the Tama hardware didn't fit so good in it. So I just go, okay, let me just try the Pearl drums. Why not? I'll try it. But the cymbals, um, I started out with the Rude. I think he said that, right? So I, 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 I started out with the Rude cymbals, and um, I was breaking them quite a bit. So finally, after years of breaking them, um, I asked uh, Kelly Pisce, um about – another symbol that I wouldn't break as much. And she said, the reason you're breaking roots is because they're so thick and they don't have any give. So they just instantly break. Cause I was thinking, why am I breaking so many symbols? So then I went to a, a bit thinner symbol, the uh, signature series, but there's that's still a pretty thick symbol. So then I went to her and I said, what's thinner than a, a signature series, but still sounds good. She said, you're going to love the 2002s. They're flexible. They have a lot of ring to it. And they sound really high end. So now I'm playing 2002s, and I'm thinking, why did I waste all those years playing playing, playing Pisces Roots? <laughs> the 2002s, they're, they're, they're crisper. Um, and again, the flexibility is a good thing. It's great to not break a cymbal every three or four days. Nice. See, Rich, that's what I was talking about before the, the show. Some of these questions, that, that was something I would never ask, but we get a really good answer. <laughs> no, I, I imagine people would ask that. And you, you should cover how you went to the pearl rack because it's square and not round. So it wasn't rotating on you. Yes, that's why I went to the pearl. I tried to go just to the pearl rack and use all my Thomas stuff. And um, it, it just it wasn't kind of, I mean, it was kind of compatible, but not really great. So just to see, because I haven't played any other drums, I wanted to try the pearl hardware with the toms and all that. So. I just ordered the Decade Maple kit from Pearl, uh, just basically because, basically because it's an all maple shell, like the Star Classic. Do you still have the? Oh, hang on, sorry, I missed it. Do you still have the Tequila Sunrise drum kit? I do. Packed away. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's probably next to that where that uh, platinum record plaque was, right? <laughs> Underground. Uh, to both you guys from. Uh, Right here, uh, to David and Rich, both which breaking in a sequence song is your favorite to play live? Uh, yours, David. In honestly, I think maybe, maybe delusional. I would say I, delusional between delusional and surprise for me, or twine. So, yeah, twine's great. It, it, it changes all the time. I can have a favorite one week and the next week have another favorite, yeah. So you, you guys will hear the new Breaking in a Sequence songs. They're all kind of like a different genre, each one of them. Um, but they're yeah. not so far off that it's a, a completely different genre, but they just all have a different feel to them. Yep. I was watching some, uh, kind of going back, watching some David stuff. And one thing I noticed was back in the 90s, early 2000s, pre-camera phones, man, how just amazing it was to look out and see people actually getting into the music and not trying to be amateur cinematographers, you know, how, how amazing that must've felt. Talking about the like, jumping crowds. Yeah. Just looking out and seeing everybody not have their phones in their hands and actually just enjoying the music. We were fortunate enough to, to write groove music, which enticed jumping. Yeah. So yeah, the jumping was definitely amazing <laughs> to watch. Great feel crowd participation is always fun. What is the longest you think you've ever did the ride symbol for blind before the song kicked in? <laughs> uh, it, it probably seemed longer, but it was probably only about two minutes. Yeah. I, I, I think I figured there's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> there's gotta be a show out there where you're just like, if, if they don't start this song, I swear to God, I'm going to start throwing stuff at everybody. <laughs> yeah. I think it was Phil just messing with me because he starts out with the bass line and nothing else happens until yeah. he does his bass tag. I think, uh, I can't remember where we were at, but I think one time he just let me go and go and go. And I was looking at him going, come on, let's get this song going, man. <laughs> I think he was just messing with me. <laughs> See, well, guys, I awkward. definitely appreciate That was a crazy question, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, you know, it's actually funny as I actually asked Joey Jordison that one time, uh, kind of just seeing how long they would make him do it, uh, kind of just filling in for you. How long do you say? Uh, I think you said the same thing. You say, you know, it's not that bad. You know, you just kind of, I think the little, 
uh, the bell kind of breaks it up so it's not just killing your arm the whole time. Uh, yeah, I can see that. <laughs> I don't know. Just doing just doing anything rep, uh, repetitive like that, I'm sure it would would finally you know your arm would fall off eventually. Hey, David, we should try that <laughs> yeah. in our next practice, like five minutes. I'll time it. No. <laughs> we'll go live. We'll go yeah. live on Facebook. Yeah, more. Just play the bell. There you go. More concert. The bell. <laughs> five minute bell. <laughs> now, are you guys playing corn songs live? Are you going to do anything like that? Or are you guys strictly going to do just uh, breaking into sequence stuff? Breaking the sequence. Yeah, we're not going to. Can't cover my old band. Well, I mean, it's not necessarily cover now, is it? Uh, well, for the for band, the it would four be of us, it is. <laughs> 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 but you have an innovator back there on the drums behind you. So you're, you're, I think you're allowed to do that if you, you want to. I guess we maybe could. maybe late in the career, well, and then um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, if you guys get thrown out on like a tour and you have to fill out a set, you'd be like, "Damn it! I guess we're gonna have to do uh, <laughs> you know, we'll have to throw blind into this set, or you just do some deep cuts that corn doesn't." Play, you know? I guess it's a possibility. You never know what happened. But you know, it's one of the. There we go. Well, as we kind of wrap this up, you know, I mean, we've talked about kind of the, the, the future of the band, you know, I mean, what are your, you know, what are your grand, uh, you know, desires for the band, David? Grand desires to become a worldwide touring band and get a, hopefully there's a regular record deal out there. I don't know about these 360 deals that are, that are presented to everyone, but I mean, the, the times have changed, but anyways, grand yep. scheme of things, we want to be a, a worldwide touring band. Rich? Yeah. yeah, I think, I think you know, um, be a touring band that's successful enough so that uh, the rest of us don't have to work day jobs. <laughs> Absolutely, man. I can go, I can go along and be your uh, podcasting, uh, you know, a roadie guy. <laughs> yeah, you can be the, you can be the nudger that gets, uh, that gets David to go yeah. to the Rolodex. Hey, I want to show yeah, you guys the surfboard. The all right, let's do the surfboard. Check check out the surfboard. It's it's sideways, but it was presented from uh, Sony Music in Australia. I'll start at the top. You see that? All right. Yep. See the CDs on there? Oh, nice. See the cap? That's oh, yeah, the tattoo. That's I have tattoo, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. That's the whole thing there. <laughs> So, how much grief did you get, David, for being for, for the Calvin Klein stuff? Um, I don't, I don't, I didn't really even get any grief. I mean, what, what are people to say? I mean, it's, <clears throat> it was, um, it was when the first uh, the fad became of jeans being ripped up and torn, right? Yeah. So the, the so Calvin Klein started making pre ripped jeans you could buy. They call them dirty denim. That's what the ad was for. It was just for the, I guess the style back then was all ripped, faded jeans and shit. So they started making them. So that was what the ad was for. The dirty denim campaign. Um, as far as I remember, I don't think anybody at all gave me shit. In fact, um, when we made the twisted transistor, <laughs> the twisted transistor video, we had everyone playing like like Little John and and um, David Banner. Snoop Dogg was in the video, and uh, David. These are rappers, of course. You know that. David Banner played me, and, and he, he like right. actually. Uh, I, I think one of the scenes was uh, someone was supposed to be looking at a magazine, yelling at him, going, "Man, why you do this ad?" And he gets mad. He takes the magazine and rips it. It was pretty funny. <laughs> I love that the, the uh, ladies in the chat room are now coming in talking about how much they love those pictures of David. <laughs> <laughs> That's too good. The um, yeah, man, that's just a it's definitely a, a fun period for everybody. Yep. <laughs> and there's another one. Uh, the um, was it true that Puma paid you guys like half a million to go from Adidas to Puma? No, nope, absolutely not. It was more, right? Okay. Um, <laughs> no, it, it's, that's not true. They did not. They did not pay us to go from Adidas to Puma. All right, nice. there was a, there was a switch there, and I you know I I always heard there was some money behind it. So, 
maybe they just didn't tell you like that meme of everybody gets some, then it gets to David and he's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen that one. That's funny. That's, um, well, I mean, you know what, uh, you know, um, I guess we'll just end on, you know, so what's something you want to say to the fans, David? <sighs> Keep it out for us. We're coming out as soon as this COVID thing's over. We're going to be hopefully playing some shows and hopefully getting on a tour because at that point, I think everybody's going to be ready to go on tour. So mm -hmm. uh, I, I can't see us not going on some kind of tour, or getting on a, a tour after this COVID thing's over. I'm sure it's going to be so busy. It's going to be it's just going to be booked for a couple of years in advance as soon as this thing's over. Uh, but just tell people to look for our music on all the digital platforms and stick with us. We're going to keep releasing new music and um, hopefully we'll get to a town with them soon. Rich, yeah, same thing. Now easier to find. Yes. <laughs> yeah, much easier to find. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no interpunk. Well, well, too awesome. <laughs> right. Well, two cool guys, man. Thanks for taking the time tonight. And uh, it's been a lot of fun catching up. And we'll have to do this again. Thank, Thank you for having us, Josh. Thanks, Thanks guys. Thanks. Oh. All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And, uh, make sure to rate, review, subscribe, all that good stuff. And we will talk to you soon. Hey.